say the least, somebody went to a hell of a lot of trouble to make sure that when we looked things up, we wouldn't fare too well. And we would come up with totally unreliable pictures of ourselves. But I've compiled what few facts I could, I mean, such as they are, to see if we could find out a little bit of something. And this is what I got so far. No, and by the way, no, we're not black. We're, how about that? We're not black, nigga. We're Indian. Yeah. We're Native American. Yeah. How many of y'all grandmothers got Indian in your family? Yeah. Yeah. You're Indian? <laughs> yeah. Oh, come on, man. Yeah, you yeah. What be kind of Indian are you? Like Tonto Indian? Sh shitty cock Indian. Yeah, I had no idea about the history. I had no idea how inclusive this group is and what it means to be part of Standing Rock and be part of the United Sioux Nations. Well, I have one. It's my tribal tattoo. I'm from, um, you know, the Pamunkey tribe. Standing asked my grandma, yo, grandma, what's your background? She's like, red foot and um, black tail Indian. What? Yeah, my mother and my father, they, we are 100% Indians. I've been in the business so long, and I'm the only Indian in the business today. Memphis is now uh, becoming the most populated with African Americans. Um, Indigenous Americans. Say that again? Indigenous. Okay. You ever did your, um, your ancestry? You know how to do this thing? I never did it. Man, I want to. I want to see what I'm mixed with. Yeah. Where I'm from, everybody they they uh grandparents and stuff be like Indians and shit. They Indian. Mm -hmm. Native American with their long, pretty hair, their curly shit. And we are not Africans. We are not African. Are you African, baby? I'm not no African. You African? I ain't African. I don't know nobody. Find your tribe season. Mm. Find your tribe season. It really is about reconnecting to your lineage and appreciating it you know and when you find your identity it's just you're not walking confused out here and trying to piece yourself together from other people's knowledge about who you are you know because there's a lot of false information about who we are as indigenous black people territories tribes like people be thinking indians with the with the pocahontas looking that ain't how indians look they look like them people in New Orleans. Mm. Indian, well, excuse me, Louisiana, all over Louisiana. Them Indians, tribes. Aborigines, which means what? Black folks. When they, you never find a white aborigine. Aborigines are called natives, or they're always dark-skinned people. You and I are aborigines, but you don't let them be called an aborigine. People are Native Americans. You know, we, we've had, you know, a lot of uh, proof that, you know, some of us started here in this land. Uh, we weren't, everybody wasn't brought over from Africa. These black people lying to us? How many people have you heard say that they're Native American, that are dark-skinned black Americans, foundational black Americans? How many of these people have you heard say that their family is black and Native American. How many of your family members have told you that you're black and Native American? Or really, they just said Native American and left out the black. In the case of an American Negro, born in that glittering republic, and in the moment you are born, since you don't know any better, every stick and stone and every face is white, and since you have not yet seen a mirror, you suppose that you are too. It comes as a great shock to discover that Gary Cooper killing off the Indians when you were rooting for Gary Cooper, that the Indians were you. We're very well documented on what was happening. Hold on. Black and Native American. Corlean, Black and Native American. Um, Black and Native American, Joe. Um, over and over again, we keep seeing Black and Native American, all right? Black and Native American, Black and Native American, all right? We keep seeing that over and over again. We have been the at the forefront of running this stuff. That's just history. Because there's something in us in a transformation that we have gone through. No matter how damn degenerated we might look today walking around the ghettos or whatever. There's something in us that's unique. That puts us closer to the ancient Egyptians than the damn Africans. That's why we connected back with it. 
and this was prophesized. We're copper skinned people. The reason why I say so-called African-Americans, because not all, but 98 percent of the so-called Africans is in America and not African at all. We actually are indigenous to this land and we come from this land. So we have to quit acting like that all life started in Africa. No, all life simulated everywhere. There have been black people on every inch of this planet since the beginning of this earth. And you said he looked Indian. Was he Indian? Was yes, he, he was. Mixed? He was okay. part, um, um, what do you call him? Well, my mom, she comes from the Blackfoot. And my dad came from the Seminoles, the Florida Indians, yeah. Federal law. Federal law says these people, Creek of African descent, are 100% Creek citizens. And we intend to prove that in the district court, and if we have to appeal it, whatever we have to do, we will do that. And then concluding, my, my grandmother, Grandma, please said, <laughs> that's my 86-year-old grandmother, Johnny May Austin. Her father, my great-grandfather, John W. Simmons, was a Creek we roll Creek Minor, Creek number 602. My grandma tells me how she grew up speaking Creek, going to Creek events. She was a Creek. Our family has been Creek for as long as we've been around. We're doing this for people like her. Thank you. The kids around my neighborhood used to think I was Cuban at the time because I looked different, so. I guess the way it works is people are so used to seeing what is depicted as an Indian within the movies, the old movies and things. So if you don't look that way, they don't expect you to be Indian. They think you're either black or Hispanic or something else. When we were coming up, it was a bad thing, I guess, to be Native American. And so, I mean, you was just classified as black or that's the way you went. And, you know, a lot of... A lot of the older people, they never told you. I mean, it was, it was a long time before I really found out. Creek, Black Creek or so-called Creek Freeman descendants, please stand. Please just stand and be recognized. Please stand. Please stand. <laughs> These individuals and so many more across this nation grew up under speaking Creek, living Creek, Creek ways, they understood what it meant to be Creek. And just like my grandmother, Johnny Mae Austin, just had it ripped from them, illegally, ripped from them, and told that they were not who they are. And to say the least, somebody went to a hell of a lot of trouble to make sure that when we looked things up, we wouldn't fare too well. And we would come up with totally unreliable pictures of ourselves. But I've compiled what few facts I could, I mean, such as they are to see if we could find out a little bit of something. And this is what I got so far. So I've just showed you video proof of black Americans, celebrities and others just telling you that they're Native American. So are these people lying? Or are these people telling the truth? How many people would say this if it was a lie? Now let's listen to it from the mouths of people who aren't black. Term, uh, Negro or black for a wide variety of people, uh, other than people from Africa. Uh, they apply the term uh, very commonly to the native people of India uh, and to other areas of Southeast Asia. Uh, but uh, when they arrive in Brazil, they also use the term for the native people of Brazil. Uh, they call the Indians of Brazil negros da terra, which means uh, the natives of the land. And uh, then later, when they begin uh, bringing people over from Africa, they call them Negros da Guine, uh, black people from Guinea. Uh, this term Negro is just used very commonly, interchangeably with Indio. The average African-American genome is very distinct from the African genomes from which they, they were taken, which means that, on average, someone from Senegal is more different genetically to someone from Angola than either of those people are to anyone else on the rest of the planet. So Afro-Indigenous people exist, and we're going to keep going over this. Um, Afro-Indigenous people are here. They've always been here, and they're not going anywhere.
Afro-Indigenous people, especially on this app, um, but in life also, are being treated worse than any other group of people by our people. Americans were a rich brown people. Mm -hmm. They were mahogany in color. Says that from the beginning, it was a melting pot tribe. So these people all banded together and somehow became Seminole? Became Seminole. And in fact, the word Seminole is not even uh, an Indian word. It is derived from a Spanish word, uh, cimarron, meaning runaway slave. And so from the beginning, you don't have an Indian tribe. It was a multi-ethnic coalition. The black people, they are the original owners of America. Black wow. people, Af wow. African Americans, they were already here and they plagued them out and they stole the, Smith, the Smithsonian Institute, which is Jesuit controlled, stole their knowledge, stole their history and now we're just left wondering who we are, where we are, where we come from, where we're going, we don't know anything. Just go into a country, plague the whole place mm -hmm. out and then take over their buildings. New York was already there for thousands of years. San Francisco was there for thousands of years. Los Angeles was there for thousands of years. They were built by the indigenous people who were black and, Indi and, and Indians as well. Whoa. The black people, they are the original owners of America. Live with that it, for me, is distinctly nitmuck. The same time you have the white culture saying, no, you're shoemakers now, and more importantly, you're a person of color. You're no longer a Nipmuc person. And that shows through in these um, county histories and also in the census records at the time. You find a person described in the 1860 census as an Indian. In the 1870 census, they're described as a person of color or a colored person. Same person, but the census taker as part of the white dominant society decides that this person is no longer Nipmuc. The indigenous people say, I got a story time for you. So my family was one of those families, you know, we've got this much Cherokee in our ancestry and they had some things to kind of back it up. There were like paintings or artifacts, uh, you know, sort of things to be like, oh, actually, no, we do. Uh, so imagine their surprise when we did an ancestry test and none, zero, despite the glorious cheekbones, those not indigenous. But then where did these receipts come from to say that we did have this ancestry? Uh, it was a bit more sinister than the fam was expecting. Have you heard of the Cherokee land lotteries? I hadn't, but apparently my family won one. So when the Cherokees were ousted from their land, Trail of Tears, all of that, their land was lotteried off. My family bought into the raffle and won one of these plots of land with everything that was still on it from when the family was forcibly removed. This is why we had pictures and artifacts, things that my family just, you know, whitewashed into our story of, oh, this is part of our history. I mean, when, when they talk about appropriation, y'all. In this time of banned books and suppressing narratives that don't look good on our country, it's important that we tell our stories so that people can know the truth of what happened. Now, are all of these people lying? Are all of these black people and non-black people, Native Americans, white people, are they lying? Or are they actually telling us some kind of truth? Now, many of us sit here and you'll hear a lot of people say, you must have just been mixed with a black American. You just must have had some kind of marriage relation or you just want the good hair or something like that. But it's too many black people here in America in many different areas, especially in the South, very concentrated into the South, Southeast that is, as well as many in the Northeast, all along the East Coast and as well as there were some on the West. But regardless of that, there was many of them that were already here. And many of them, their grandparents have told them that they've been here. And so in this documentary, I'm going to go into deeper reasons and more information to prove that black Americans are the real Native Americans. And this video was put together with a collaboration of people who I've watched over the years. So this is really more of a fair use documentary for uh, uh, informational purposes only. All evidence documents their close relationship. Blacks became chiefs, 
signed treaties, and served on the tribal council. They intermarried. They were equals, Opala says, and the Indians depended on them as warriors and interpreters. So there absolutely is proof of the black Seminole importance to the tribe. Absolutely. There's a lot of intelligence information that passes back to Washington. For instance, uh, General Jessup, the commanding uh, uh, general, writes back at one point to the War Department and says, the Negroes rule the Indians. What he was referring to was the fact that no significant decision was ever taken in the Seminole councils unless the, the black members uh, agreed to it. When the Red and Black Seminoles were forced out of Florida in the 1830s, they traveled together hundreds and hundreds of miles by boat and on foot, passing through this barren place on the banks of the Arkansas River all the way to Oklahoma. It was a long and difficult journey referred to as their trail of tears for the many who died along the way. Now, nearly 200 years later, comes the $56 million payment from the federal government to compensate the tribe for those lost Florida lands. Let's dig a little bit deeper into are we the real Native Americans or is that just a lie or a myth? I think we find that the freedom was one that was doing most of the fight. Mm -hmm. And they fought to be free. But the black Seminoles can't share in it because the government and the tribe say they were slaves of the red Seminoles back then and as slaves could not have owned land. Joe Opala, who has worked to preserve their legacy, says that's wrong. The black Seminoles fought side by side, died, bled for those lands in Florida. Uh, they've, they've been together, they've been good brothers and good neighbors uh, for three centuries. It makes no sense now to say they're not Indians. Our ancestors were some of the most fiercest fighters during the war. During the Indian War? Yes. Due to the fact that they knew if they were recaptured, they were going into slavery, mm -hmm. back in the slavery. Bud Crockett and his sister Polly Gentry trace their Seminole roots back to their great-grandmother Dora Davis, who came to Oklahoma on the Trail of Tears. Spanish colony of Florida, another group joined with them, runaway slaves. The Seminoles welcomed these people. They were good warriors, and they also were experienced in agriculture. The piece of information they had, or at least this is what we were taught, is that unlike the civilized people of Europe, these tribal units actually fought. And yes, there was some crude implements, and yes, there was primitive art, and yes, they were masters of hunting and fishing, and courtesy came from the heart. The Seminoles flourished in Florida, farming and amassing large herds of free-ranging cattle, a legacy of early Spanish explorers. Story takes a turn to the Trail of Tears, and this is where I kind of found a, 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 an emotional uh, uh, or a specific interest myself being from Oklahoma. Uh, being from Oklahoma, I had no clue that, you know, of hardly anything. In fact, it was, I was uh, a, an adult by the time I found out there was a ton of black owned towns. But my granny and papa both came from black owned towns. Actually, my granny, my papa came from Hugo, which I don't believe Hugo was all black, but uh, Bowley, Oklahoma was an all-black town at the time. So the Trail of Tears and being from Oklahoma had a special interest to me because there's a lot of black people in Oklahoma and that's where I'm from. But I started to look more into this, especially learning about the Dolls Rolls. Once I learned about the Dolls Rolls and actually ended up finding my family within those roles, at least some of the last names, um, that's when I had to start digging way deeper into the topic of are black people in America Native Americans? But you think if there were benefits for them, suddenly freedmen would be coming from yes. all across the country? Yes. Let me tell you what it looks like from the outside, though. It looks like the freedmen fought wars, died with you, moved on the trail of tears from Florida to Oklahoma with you. And now suddenly there's a big pot of money. Let's exclude them. That, that may be true to some extent, but I don't think that's all of the uh, reasons for what has happened. He also says the Red and Black Seminoles have just grown apart over the years and have little in common today. 
But that's not how Sylvia Davis sees it. She's hired Will and John Veeley, two young attorneys who specialize in Indian law. They're suing the government on behalf of the black Seminoles. Today, you have to be able to prove your Indian heritage, which is hard for most black Seminoles because of something called the Dawes Rolls, a government census of sorts created in the late 1800s, which separated the tribe into the blood or red Seminoles and the freedmen or black Seminoles. Intermarriage made no difference, as Polly and Bud discovered with their ancestors. If you had any black blood in you whatsoever, you were a freedman. So it didn't matter how much Indian blood you had. Just right. Any black blood, right. you went on a separate roll. Right. And on the black mm -hmm. Seminole roll, it doesn't list that you have any Indian blood. That is correct. Mm -hmm. Did you feel equal to the blood Seminoles? Sure, at one time, yes. Still do. It was the United States government that segregated Creek, so-called Creek freedmen. It was the United States government that used the hypo descent rule that said one drop of black blood makes you black. It was the United States government that created a separate role of so-called Creeks by blood and so-called Creek freedmen. That was not something that the Creeks did themselves. However, in 1979, the Creek Nation, relying upon this openly racist Dawes Rolls decided to segregate, strip, and steal the heritage, culture, and citizenship of those Creek, so-called Creek freedmen and their descendants. So as you can tell right here, they're talking about how the black native Seminoles, and that's just one particular nation and area, but the black Seminoles were uh, instrumental uh, in being the warriors and interpreters for the red skin looking wild natives uh, up in Spanish territory down there in the south in Florida. So they depended on us in order to make sure that they could live and survive. And so when we were, if they depended on us to be the warriors, and that's what started going through my head, if they depended on us to be the warriors, then why would we be their slaves later? What does that mean? What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is there's this story that goes around that says the Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, all of those in the Seminoles, they owned slaves. And, and that the black people they came over with them on the Trail of Tears was apparently their slaves and not just some free blacks that was with them. And so when we got to Oklahoma, we was their slaves still even there. But that didn't make sense to me because the black owned town started in the early to mid 1800s or so. So I knew that that was pretty much right after the Seminole Wars and right after the Trail of Tears. So they tried to conclude cock this story and say that we were just slaves. But as you can see here on this particular uh, news clipping, they're actually talking about how we were not their slaves. We were the fiercest fighters in the war, and we actually had a say over anything that happened within the uh, tribal communities. But when, what happened was when the whole Trail of Tears happened, they classified black people as slaves. Doesn't mean that you were a slave. They legally said that if you have black skin, that you were a slave. So at this particular point, now legally, not necessarily that you were literally, legally, not literally, you were a slave. So you got all these people saying Creeks, Chickasaws, all these people owned slaves. Some of them did. Not all of them owned slaves, especially the black ones. But we'll get into that. But one thing that didn't make sense to me is if we were the main ones doing all the fighting, meaning if the Seminole Red Indians depended on us as warriors, then why would, after the war, we get put out on the Trail of Tears, get put on free land along with them, why would we become their slaves? It just wouldn't even make sense that we would be slaves to people that we just protected. We would whoop your ass. We would just sit there and... You say, okay, hey, y'all, legally y'all are slaves now. We know y'all was protecting us and everything, but go ahead and uh, be our slaves, you know? Uh, no, we would go ahead and turn these rifles right up on you. Uh, none of it made sense to me. And as you can hear here, they're actually putting out a case. The reason why they legally classified us as slaves is so that way they can legally exclude us from the 50 something million dollars that was given to the tribes at the time and the red native Indians could keep the money to themselves. So that's why it happened and that's why that moniker or that fake information is going around today.
their troops from Indian territory, leaving the Indians with no protection. But Albert Pike, Confederate Indian commissioner, soon signed treaties with the Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, and Seminole nations, and with the Wild Plains tribes in Western Indian territory. He even signed a group of Osage led by Captain Black Dog. The five tribes of Oklahoma became full allies of the Confederacy and agreed to furnish troops and supplies. The Plains tribes agreed to raid Union settlements in Kansas and Colorado instead of Texas. Oh, so when you look at this map, it actually shows you where all the tribal nations was. And this is one of the maps I remember looking at. And then I remember putting it right next to this map, which is the map of the um, all black towns that were founded in, um, in Oklahoma during the time. And when you put them next to each other, you'll notice all the black owned towns are actually in those nations, the five civilized tribes nations. Now you have the Plains nation down here at the bottom left. And so it started making me wonder, What's up with that? Why are all these black towns here? Okay, well, we, you know, we were Chickasaws, Creeks. We maybe had something to do with being Indians. Were we the main people there? Were we the only ones? I was still questioning it, but I was on to something because eventually I, I pulled up the Dolls Rose and I noticed that a lot of these blacks' names on here and a lot of the first names, the surnames and the first names, were um, looked like black names, like Minnie Overstreet, Every Brown, uh, Jeremiah Bruner, uh, Esther Williams, names like that. Not names like Littlefoot, not a whole lot of names like that. Now, I'm not saying there aren't some black people in certain tribes that didn't have certain names like Running Bear and things of that nature. But those naming structures were typically allocated or done within the red native tribes communities. We had our own separate type of naming structure based upon how we talked and what we called ourselves, you know? So that's what I started to really realize. And then I realized another thing, they called these the civilized tribes. And the civilized tribes are those who lived a lot more civilly. They, a lot, they um, the civilized tribes didn't have a problem having allocated areas of land, small square patches of land and, and living in a different civil manner versus living off the land and moving around and about from space to space, going anywhere you want to go is what the, Asia, the, the Red Mongolian natives were doing at the time. So we actually changed it up and we're living civilly. And that's proven later, as you'll see, that during the same time that we were living in homes, Structurally built homes out of wood and brick and whatever. We got downtown, we got buildings, we got cars and all that. At the same time you see us having all that, you look at them at the same time, the Red Mongolian natives, and they're still living in teepees. They're still moving from place to place. They're still living in a, in a primitive-like manner. And so that started to really tell me who was the really civilized ones. 49. Blacks among the Seminoles were legally declared slaves. In defiance, Seminole war hero John Horse and his partner, Wildcat, rebelled. This system of exploitation, the federal government was able to systematically reduce the Native Americans' control over 100 million acres of land down to 20 million through its implementation of these individual allotments. Qualified full-blooded members of the Creek Indian tribe were eligible for an allotment of 160 acres. According to the treaty, all freedmen born into slavery who were classified as citizens of the Creek Indian tribe were also eligible for an allotment of 160 acres. John Rector and his wife Betty, along with other Creek freedmen, chose to merge their allotments to form their own town of newly freed African Americans that they voted to call Taft in 1904. It was quite impressive that this small, determined group of freedmen with no formal education was able to build this bustling early 20th century town that had two newspapers, three general stores, a brickyard, drugstore, a soda pop factory, a livery stable, grist mill, two hotels, a restaurant, a bank, and a funeral home, all before 1910. Sitting 45 miles southeast of Tulsa, Oklahoma, Taft today is one of the only 13 all-black towns still in existence in Oklahoma. At the time, it was one of 50 settlements founded by freedmen. So from this point, I start to look up, okay, 
What is some of the earliest information I can find about some of the Native American tribes that are out there today? And so here is some of the old footage that I found that actually, sometimes you gotta think about it like this. When people are liars, right? When people are lying about history or lying about anything, typically, if you're smart enough, you can catch them in the lies. A lot of time, a liar is going to slip up here or there. You know, some of this stuff has been lied about for so long that we really haven't given it enough scrutiny of thought as far as what we've been told about our history. So when I'm going through some of these old films, I'm starting to listen to it in a way with an active ear. And when you listen to it with an active ear, you literally hear what they're saying. The white folks brought all the civilization because there wasn't none around. How could the folks be civilized when there wasn't nobody writing nothing down? And just to prove all of their suspicions, well, didn't take too long. They found out that there were whole tribes of people in plain sight running around with no clothes on. That's right. The men, the women, the young and the old righteous folks covered their eyes and no time was spent considering the environment. Hell no, this just wasn't civilized. In fact, their dress was a likeness of the white man's, contrasting sharply to the traditional Indians. For example, Sequoia, the legendary Cherokee, had only passing respect for color, as seen in his famous turban, but otherwise looked as if he could have served in Jackson's cabinet. His name was George Guess, but in Cherokee, Sequoia and his legacy is all around us. It was he that devised by himself a system for his people to read and write. As you can see here, they got a guy named Sequoia. He looks just like any other white guy. He says it here. He looks like he just could have served in Jackson's cabinet, anybody's white cabinet. Basically, he looks like the average white person. They even tell you that his name was George Guess, right? His name was George Guess. His name now in Cherokee is Sequoia, and he was appointed as chief over his people, and he devised a system for his people to read and write. I'm sorry, that doesn't really make sense. How do you, that's not your people. Your name is George Guess. You look like a white person, and even this next person, they tell you, he is a white person and he just married into the family and they talk about the into the tribes and stuff and stuff like that. So they tell you in some of their old videos that these white people had a different name. And, and you know, when you're when you don't listen to this stuff with an active ear or if you're not at a certain age to where you can really comprehend what they're telling you, you could easily be fooled. A lot of us have been fooled led the Cherokees for more than 40 years. In every way, the man of style and charm in 1832. Ross and Sequoia demonstrate forcibly the widespread intermarriage between the five tribes and white missionaries and early European pioneers. It was this fact that accounted for their adoption of the white man's manner, from living in some instances on plantations to owning Negro slaves. What you're gonna notice here is the five or six people that they've appointed, I think it's five people, the five people that they've appointed to be chiefs of the five civilized tribes, so obviously five, uh, just look at the way these people look. They're either white looking, Asian looking, or Mongolian somewhat looking, you know? They don't look like the tribal members. They don't look like the people who we know to be Native American today. There's been the final word. Statehood meant they now had neither. Yet even today, within the tribes, there still exists some organizational rule. It is called the Intertribal Council, run by five members of each tribe and is intended to advance those special concerns of Indians. Its highest officers are the five leaders or principal chiefs of each tribe. Harry J.W. Belvin of Durant, Choctaw. Overton James of Oklahoma City, Chickasaw. W.W. W. Keeler of Bartlesville, Cherokee. John Brown of Sasakwa, Seminole. And W.E. McIntosh of Tulsa, Creek. Their leaders are either elected by the tribes themselves or appointed by the Secretary of the Interior. It is his department through the Bureau of Indian Affairs that supervises the federal services to all United States Indians. 
The Inter-Tribal Council, in turn, is assisted by the Muscogee Area Office of Indian Affairs. The Muscogee, or Creek tribe, with a population of more than 30,000, in recent years has distinguished itself as one of the most progressive tribes in Oklahoma. More than a decade ago, Principal Chief Claude Cox and his advisors began identifying the problems faced by Indian people. They set priorities and goals to focus on as the Creek Nation re-emerged as a functioning tribal organization. Creeks who adopt agricultural practices that uh, patterned uh, after the whites, and one of those in the South was slave trade. I don't ever talk about it very much because I think it's a very shameful part of, um, of Cherokee history, and so I've purposely avoided involving myself in that, um, in that whole issue. While the current chief may be ashamed, at the Cherokee Museum today are slave bills of sale, including one for three slaves bought in 1841 by then-principal chief John Ross. The chief and his brother, Lewis, were among the biggest slaveholders in the tribe. Indeed, many of my mother, Kathleen's ancestors, the Rosses, were owned by the chief's family. Tell this lady's last name is Mankiller. Mankiller. And she just talked about how her family used to own slaves. And there was the other guy that talked about them owning slaves. And so when you look at that and you see the other white guy, the guy before that, which was uh, the little heavyset white dude, he was uh, another person who was appointed as a chief of the Creeks, I believe, and sat there and he owned slaves himself. So when these people say that the Creeks Choctaws, Chickasaws, or whatever, they owned slaves. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. They did own slaves. But the slaves that they owned were owned by the people who likely was appointed as chiefs, the white, the $5 white Indians. They were the ones who owned the slaves. Now, I'm not saying 100% that I know that no black people own slaves whatsoever. I'm not 100% sure about that. But what I can tell you, I can tell you that these people are admitting to owning the slaves. They're admitting and showing you that they were the chiefs that were appointed. They're telling you that they were white and had a different name and they got, they changed their name to a creek name or whatever. And, and they're telling you what's going on. So if you want to really find the truth, the truth is there. You just have to go looking for it and you need to have an active ear. That means that that there were 20,000 of us by 1906. And that was just the people who were proof. You're looking at photos of actual people who were enrolled by the Dawes Commission. If you start clockwork, you have Mayfield Riley, who was a Creek, right? Caesar Bruner, who was a Seminole. Sally Walton, who is the grandmother of Angela Walton Raji, who was a Choctaw. Gladys Ligon, who was the aunt of Terry Ligon, who was a Chickasaw. And then my two aunts, Aunt Clarence, who I mentioned to you earlier, who died at the age of 15, and Aunt Edna Rogers, who were Cherokee. So she just gave us information about how many people that she found on the Dawes Rolls that were black. The Dawes Rolls, like I said, are full of black names. And these people ignore that. They say that you were slaves, you had nothing to do with it, and that the only type of Indian that you have to do with Indian is that you were an Indian slave. And, and maybe some of you may have married in and, and had you know relations with slaves and made families and made it in, but many of you didn't. Well, my family, at least three of the names are listed under blood Indians. The fourth one is listed as a freedman. If you go on the list as a freedman, as we saw, then that means that you were a slave. So some of them were listed as slaves. Some of them were listed by blood. We are natives by blood. Some are natives by freedmen. But technically, they were probably natives by blood, but just somehow got caught up into the slavery. My next goal was to look for as much of the oldest Native American footage I can find. What is, now, video footage hasn't been around forever, so the oldest you'll probably get is the very late 1800s, but I found some very early 1900s footage of some Native Americans. And let's look at how they lived and see what information we could find about them. Also, I wanted to look up documentaries because what kind of information can I find out about these people? What is the earliest information and dates that we can find that these people were here?
People have occupied the Americas for perhaps as long as 40,000 years. Over these years, they have created great civilizations, equaling any found in Europe, Asia, and Africa. In North America, Paleo-Indians hunted the mammoths and mastodons. They were replaced by archaic Indians, who lived from 5,000 to 1,000 BC. They left behind remarkable cave art. In at least one instance, they hunted bison, the species known as the American buffalo, by driving them into kill sites on the eastern Colorado plains. But these hunter-gatherers were moving towards becoming agricultural societies. Then as the Europeans expanded across the continent, the surviving tribes were pushed ever westward into a constantly redefined and shrinking Indian territory. However, during the middle of the 18th century, two parallel events occurred on the North American continent. The creation of a new type of nation, the United States of America, and the creation of a new kind of Indian culture, the warrior horse culture themselves into nomadic, buffalo-hunting horse cultures. Horse cultures with names like the Cheyenne, the Sioux, the Comanche, the Kiowa, and the Arapaho. The Kiowa's journey onto the plains began somewhere in the Kootenay region of British Columbia, Canada. From there, they migrated into western Montana in the 1600s. Around 1700, they reached the Yellowstone River area. Ten years later, after acquiring the horse from the Crow, they found a home in South Dakota's Black Hills. Very quickly, the Cheyenne and the Sioux drove them from this home. Again, they moved south. However, by the beginning of the 19th century, the Kiowa formed a strong military alliance with their former adversary. This alliance was at the center of the battle for the Southern Plains. Their language is believed to be part of the Aztec Tanoan linguistic stock. It is a language grouping spoken by many Mexican Indians. Like all the nomadic Indian nations, the twin centers of Kiowa life were hunting and war. So I don't know if you were able to catch that, but many of those tribes, these are the Plains Indians, the ones that were in that corner that I told you about in Oklahoma. They were allocated a portion of that and possibly parts of Texas. Well, they have a history themselves. And as I've said many of the times, they look like they're Asian, Mongolian, and they have the story of coming from the Bering Strait when it was frozen over up in the north through Canada and then coming down through to the Americas. Well, these just showed you that, yes, some of them came up there, came from up there, from in the Canadian area, and then they started to come down. But their story starts in the north in the 1700s, 16 to 1700s, right? As we just seen. So when you look at the voyages that happened, with, which were Christopher Columbus, De Soto, Ver Verrazano, uh, these are last names and some others. Uh, they actually came in 1492 was Christopher Columbus. F the 1500s, like 15 teens, 1512 or so would have been like the DeSoto expedition. And then Verrazano was around the same time, either in the, in the 15 teens or the 1520s, uh, around that same time. And they described what they saw and the people that they saw when they got here. Right. But that's still during that time. But that lets you know that they saw people when they got here. But what also you notice is I just showed you that the Kiowa, the, the other ones, they came from the north and their story starts in the 16 to 1700s. So they couldn't have been the ones that were seen by DeSoto and Verrazano when they showed up on the American shores. So what they say is if you want to hide something, hide it in the book. We can also find books on the internet. You can find almost anything you want on the internet, but shout out to the people who found this. It wasn't myself, but regardless of that, we have the book that Hernando de Soto actually wrote in the 1500s. He says what he found. He talks about who he saw. Now in this first part, I'm gonna show you about 
what he talked about when he first got there. He does talk about the people, but he talks about how there was temples built, so many structures, but he really talks about, as you can see here, that there was so many pearls uh, in this particular temple that if he had 900 men and had several voyages that, that you know, within a year, that, that still wouldn't have been enough to take back all the pearls that they found when they came up in the land. But they also found metals and other things. And their thing was, they were here to plunder. They got here, and yeah, they were happy to discover land, but don't get it twisted. They were here to plunder. Communication by drum, but no paper, no pencils, no other utensils. And hell, these folks never even heard of a gun. And this is why the colonies came, to stabilize the land. Because the dark continent had copper and gold, and the discoverers had themselves a plan. They would discover all the places with promise. You didn't need no titles and deeds. Then they would appoint people to make everything legal, to sanction the trickery and greed. The Indians of the Andes Mountains had mined precious metals and formed them into magnificent works of art, which the Spaniards robbed from the great temples of the sun god. Through ruthless plunder, De Soto collected a great fortune, but he was not content. And when the Spanish came to this part of the Alabama, uh, the first thing they would do would be to capture, let's say, the, uh, the uh, highest uh, chief of the, the village or the province, and, uh, or some of his uh, members, family members. Mm -hmm. And other things that they would do uh, to really humiliate the, uh, the ruling class. And I think after the Spanish left, they saw that their, uh, that their rulers were no longer had the uh, power behind them, you know, their God's power behind them. And uh, that they were, uh, you know, this, this force could be penetrated by, by foreign people. The Indian groups that the Soda Expedition encountered were a well-organized society. They had a ruling class. They built mounds for their leaders. They had an extensive trade network over the entire southeast, probably much over the eastern U.S. And back in the jungle when the natives got restless, they would call it guerrilla attack. And they would never describe that the folks finally got wise and decided that they would fight back. The Spaniards had had about enough of battle after Malvilla and with reluctance they arranged a battle line to face the Indians. At which point, as they neared the Indians, the Indians retreated to the river where they had hidden their canoes and crossed the river to the other side. Apparently the Indians had learned something at Malvilla. They had learned how to fight the Spaniards. At that point they began a more a guerrilla warfare technique of hitting and running, which was incredibly effective against the Spaniards. So we're going to talk even more about even other voyages. Here's Verrazano's voyage where he says that they were dark brown in color and that their hair was thick. Okay, so read even further. He says it twice. He said that they look unlike the Ethiopians. Read it twice. He says it that they were dark brown and unlike the Ethiopians, right? What type of people is that with thick hair? We have thick hair. So as of right now, I've showed you many different books that you can go look up, you can pause and actually read through them and see what the voyagers that came here and the people that came here in the 15th and 16th century, what they said in the 1500s, 1600s, what they said they saw when they arrived here to the Americas. Dark brown, copper colored, Negroes, black. These are the terms, thick hair, these are the terms that were used to describe the people 
in the Americas at the time of them seeing it. These are directly from the books. So now I had to go back and start to think of another option. Well, if I can find the information of what they look like in a book, maybe I should go to the museums. Typically you would have to go to a museum and try to find things and, and travel and this and that, but this, this is the 21st century. There are museum walkthroughs online some that are directly on the website and some you can just go to YouTube. So I decided to go to YouTube and go to the top three to four prominent Native American museums and look for the most compelling and earliest artifacts and pictures and information of these people that I can find. So what I'm looking for specifically is things from the 1600s, 1500s, 1700s, and even 1400s. As I'm going through these walkthroughs, I'm starting to notice a pattern. I'm starting to notice a lot of the patterns of big, extravagant displays with very minor and small artifacts to look at. So you, it's, it's like, this is what propaganda looks like. Propaganda talks very loudly, either being very loud with a megaphone, being very loud with having the mainstream communications like, TV and radio on lockdown, or very loud through presentation. Very loud through presentation allows them to sell a lie even easier. You have this big extravagant thing. It must be real. They spent all this money on it, right? But when you look at all these displays, you see spears, arrowheads, um, garments that they're wearing, things of that nature, baskets, things of all that, you know, but what you're not seeing, what you're not seeing at all is paintings, drawings, books, concrete information, statues of what these people look like, who these people were, you're not seeing it. So I had to go and actually, so I had to go even further into this and try to figure out what is the real deal? Who are these people? Where did they come from? How come they didn't draw themselves? You mean they t drew all this other information, but they didn't draw themselves? That doesn't make sense to me. So let's compile some more information and see what we can find out about these people. We're in the galleries at the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, looking at a painting by an artist named James Wooldridge. It's called The Indians of Virginia. These are Algon. Algonquin Indians in what was called Virginia. We get to the end here, and as you can tell, I didn't find a single thing that was really a direct image of these people, except for images that were drawn in later times, maybe 19th, 18th century like video uh, uh, drawings and things of that nature. But you're not seeing any things from the early days. And so I had to go look for even more. Okay, if I can't find any information about these Native Americans earlier than the 1800s, then what is this information that I'm finding about black people now? Let me show you photos of black people wearing feathers, having bow and arrows, and looking just like Native Americans, but with black skin, curly hair, straight hair, afros. So here's some book illustrations showing what black people look like at the time. Here's a Blackfoot Indian right here. And it shows right here, he's from the Blackfoot Nation. He looks dark skinned black. Right here, this is showing Columbus, and this is an illustration of the type of Indians that they saw when they first got here. Look pretty dark skinned to me with feathers. Oh, here's the Temple of Tolemeco. We'll go into that later. But this is Spaniards on their horses, showing them with black skinned Indians. White people with black skinned looking Indians. Look at that, these are the Potawatomis. 
we know about those people in Oklahoma. Here are some more black people with feathers. Here's some more black people. No feathers, but primitive in front of white folks. Here are some more black people with feathers. Talking about scalping white folks. We thought scalping was a red Native American, you know, red Native American Mongolian thing. But look at this. Now we can turn away from that and look at some statues. Look at that hair. Look at these feathers. Look at that black person with the feathers and the kilt, the feather kilt. Look at that black person with the feather on his head, the Mongolian next to him. Look at the black person to the left, the fake one on the right. Okay? This is the black lady, curly hair, Native American. These are black Native Americans, Afro, bow and arrow. Look at the guy over here to the left, bow and arrow, black skin. Feathers. You got a lady, blow and arrow, feathers. Look at these people, bow and arrow, feathers. Black lady, red lipstick. Black people, feathers, bow and arrows. Black women, feathers, curly hair. Black women, feathers, curly hair likely. Black person, sculpture, feathers, feather kilt. Black woman, feathers, and bow and arrows. Here's another black kid with a smoke and a pipe and, uh, and the feathers. Here's some more illustrations in a book with black people. Here's some more illustrations of the book with black people with feathers. There's black people with bow and arrows. What about that and curly hair? Black people looking like royalty more down in the Caribbean area. A tobacco production farm in 1821 with black people looking like curly hair like he could have been a Jackson 5 member. And bow and arrows. You got another black person with feathers on their head. You have black people on the sides with feathers. This was an advertisement. This was an advertisement too. A black person in the center with feathers selling uh, at tobacco, black people selling tobacco, feathers on their heads, black people, curly hair, feathers, black people, feathers, white person buying his tobacco, black person in Virginia, they're black Indians, black man, feathers in his hair, tobacco leaves, black people, We've been smoking tobacco. What do you mean? Black people. We've been doing this. Black women, curly hair. Black people with feathers on their heads, selling tobacco. Black women with a bow and arrow and some feathers on their head. Another white person came upon a group of black people with feathers. Look even closer. Black people, women with feathers on their head. Who's this? Another black person with feathers on his head? Wow. I can see black person in a kilt right here. Look at that. Look at this black person in a sculpture with feathers on her head. Look at this person, black person, feather kilt, tobacco. Look at this, okay? How many more do we have to show you? Black person in America, black people. If you look closer, this is the actual black people with feathers on their head in this particular fake emblem. Black person with feathers on her head. What do you not see at his head? Black person, feathers, clothes, black people, afros, feathers, bow and arrows, black person, feathers, feather kill, black person, feathers, feather kill, bow and arrows, bow and arrows, black person, whatever, another black person, come on now, bow and arrows, here's another one, and this is white people, uh, attacking black people and attacking their village. Look at the villages and how they're built up. Black lady in uh, feathers uh, with the white people. There you go. Some more right here. So you have to start asking, who are these people? If I just went through all of those museums and I couldn't find a single picture, very few pictures of these people and what they looked like from 1492 till damn near 1900. How come I can find these pictures of other black people in feathers and bow and arrows and none of them are in any museums or anywhere that you can even find on a regular basis? How come they're not in the history books? How, how come you didn't even know that this many people that were black that had bow and arrows and feathers and war stuff like that? I didn't know. I was pissed, so I had to go look even further to see if I can find anything else from these red natives. were on the Atlantic coast of New Jersey, New York, Delaware, and so forth. They have 
or at least it's been claimed that they have a written record called the Red Record of the Wallam Olam. The translation of it, this is the book we have in our library by David McCutcheon. We'll talk more about it shortly. Records like these, oral histories of Native Americans, have traditionally been discounted as mythological. And if you've ever read some of the Native Americans' own accounts for their history, just out of curiosity's sake or perhaps part of school, you've probably been struck by some of the fantastical, often supernatural, seemingly mythological elements of these accounts that seem like they have little potential to contribute to understanding of their pre-Columbian history. This particular account, this, is, this was published in 1993, the translation, was the subject of a PhD thesis in anthropology at Rutgers University. David O. Stryker wrote his thesis arguing that this red record, the Wallam Olam of the Delaware Indians, is indeed a hoax. And that Raffinesque, Raffinesque is the guy in the early 1800s who brought this account to the attention of Western Europeaners. He was from Kentucky. So the alleged discoverer, he was the indisputable forger. So yet another example of people saying these, these can't possibly be true. And in cases where they sound like they might be true, it turns out there's much, something much more nefarious going on. It's an authentic account of their crossing of the Bering Strait and migrating through North America, eventually arriving on the East Coast. And we'll talk about some of the details in a moment. Ostreicher in 1995 was offended by this, and, part, and he talks about the background to why he pursued his PhD topic and ends up concluding that everyone's been misinterpreting this for years, that the red record was fake. So as you've heard, these are some of the stories that have been known to be hoaxes about some of the origins of the red Asian Mongolian natives that have been known to be the Native Americans solely in this country for the last however many years. And their story doesn't seem to be holding up. So as you can see, uh, look, we're not trying to uh, disparage the red Mongolian natives. Look, you all were here at some particular point, just like we were in the Americas. It looks like you possibly came at a later time, but meaning you wasn't the ones necessarily here during the time that Christopher Columbus, De Soto, Verrazano, and the rest of the European and Spanish uh, explorers showed up. But, you know, you were here at some point. So I'm not trying to say that you wasn't here. Maybe you got here 1600s, 1700s. But what I am trying to say is, if you were here prior to the 1800s, I would love to see proof. If you can show paintings, sculptures, uh, prints, books, anything that depicts you all exactly the way that you all are described today. Not these recent photos and recent things of you all that look you know, like they were drawn last year. I'm talking about things that look like they were drawn, painted, uh, whatever, printed in the times that they were back in the day. So that's where we're at. And to kind of go back, this made me want to start looking more into the origins of the United States fully. So we know that uh, De Soto came in 1512, in the, in the 1510s, without getting too much into that. And we know that De Soto made his landing at that particular time. But what was in the Americas prior to then? I mean, we know based upon what he said in his books, but what was the vast amount of information that we can find from there? Do we have any information? Has there been any archeological things that has happened during that time? Well, we're in luck. I've actually found some new information uh, from many different sources to show you that the Americas was populated even possibly before Africa. Hidden for nearly 15,000 years, there's a new discovery that's changing what we think we know about how the Americas were settled. So there's this team at Florida State University that uh, discovered stone tools alongside mastodon bones. That means they found the oldest known site of human life in the southeastern U.S. Consider that. Think about it for just a second. We're joined now by Florida State University Assistant Professor uh, Jesse Holligan. Professor Holligan, good morning to you. Good morning to you guys. So put into just layman's waking up Saturday morning, eating my Wheaties terms, <laughs> what this means, the discovery of these tools. So these bones and artifacts show that people were in Florida um, 
1,500 years earlier than a lot of people except the Americas were colonized. And more importantly, a lot of us were taught that the Americas were colonized by some folks coming through an ice-free corridor from Alaska through Canada into North and South America around 13 and a half thousand years ago. That's what most high school textbooks say. That ice-free corridor wasn't open until 14,000 years ago. This site is 500 years older than that and in Florida, which is by any stretch of the imagination, kitty corner across the continent from Alaska. So it means that we have really have to re-examine how and when the Americas were colonized. So this is, uh, this is on its face fascinating, but when I look at the pictures and the images here, it's underwater. Yes. It, 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 some underwater sinkhole, is that what we're looking at here? Yes, it's a sinkhole in the bottom of the Osceola River. Um, the people weren't, however, scuba diving 14 and a half thousand years ago. This was a site that would have been an isolated pond about 130 miles from the coast at the time people were here 14 and a half thousand years ago because sea levels were almost 300 feet lower then and Florida was nearly twice as big. Okay, so we're just learning of this uh, this morning. Uh, as a non-archaeologist, I'm mm -hmm. excited about this, but tell me, having discovered this, what you felt, what went through your mind when you realized the, the implications of this discovery. Oh, it was so exciting, though, to be fair, we were building on research done by a number of archaeologists in the 80s and 90s who had already done some excavations at the sinkhole. They found a tusk with um, human-made they said cut marks, but it wasn't widely accepted by the archaeological community. So we were actually there to reevaluate their claims. And so finding the stone knife that we discovered um, really showed that they had been correct. The stone knife, there's absolutely no way that could be made by nature. Whereas some people had proposed that the marks on the cut could, could have been caused by elephants and by elephants, I mean mastodons st stomping around on the tusk mm -hmm. later on. And our knife showed that there's no way that wasn't done by people. So we, it wasn't that we lucked into this layer. We were really building on some previous research. But that being said, um, I don't think any of us slept the night that we found the biface. Everybody was very, very, very excited. And it's been so rewarding to get to work in that sink and uh, find these things. Of uh, the Bureau of Ethnology at the Smithsonian Institute, he said this. Um, Artifacts found prior to Christopher Columbus's arrival would be considered illegitimate by the Smithsonian. Um, only the savage Indian culture would be observed and... This created the artificial bar barrier to science. Only the savage. Science was colluding with government because of commerce and religion was involved. Now, why do I tell you all this stuff? Not because I'm an Indian expert or anything else. You've got to do your own homework. I, I just found out about this stuff. I'm amazed by it. I don't know what the answer is on this. The reason why I bring it up is the stock is not bad. The soup went bad, but the stock is not. Peter Lilback, I want to go to you and talk to you a little bit about, again, the stock. George Washington had a good relationship. Our founders had a good relationship with the Native Americans, right? There's, there's no question about that. When they came to America, they realized they could not survive without a close relationship with the Indian people. The greatest story, for example, is the pilgrims who are blown off course. 800 miles out of their destination in Virginia, they're in Massachusetts, they land on ground and they're in the middle of nowhere, no government, they make the Mayflower Compact, mm -hmm. so they have government when they land, mm -hmm. and there's no Native Americans there because a plague had gone through, but one person shows up, he happens to be a Native American that knew English. He'd actually been taken captive to England. He'd learned English, he'd gotten his freedom, he came back, his people were gone. The white settlers are there all of a sudden, and he meets them and he says, welcome. He speaks English. They couldn't believe it. The providence of that moment is extraordinary. They needed help, and there was a person there to help them. That's and he was a Native English. American. Right. And that creates Massachusetts. Right. And the Indians depended on them as warriors and interpreters. I wanted to jump in here really quick. As you can tell, they actually said that there was an interpreter that they found that came up to them and started talking. They said that he, 
you know, he was taken, captured to Europe at some point and came back. Why would he come back? How would you get your freedom? I mean, and then they let you come back and you paid to come back? That's a long voyage. How much was that voyage? You know, that doesn't make sense. What it is, is as I showed you all before, there were printed documents of the Native American blacks that were in Virginia and all of that, mostly in Virginia, uh, that were selling tobacco back and forth with the Europeans. We see the boats, we see the people, we see the white people in their red turncoat suits. It wasn't red because it was black and white print, but you can tell they were in their garb, as well as you saw the black Native Americans with the feathers and the feathers and the, and the smoking pipes and everything else like that, and they were selling them tobacco. So it's not that he was an interpreter based upon the fact that he was maybe captured. You gotta understand, many times in a lot of this stuff that I've showed you over a time, these people have admitted to just making up the story. They say, hey, we're not exactly for sure what happened, so we decided to come up with something uh, and we'll call it this. You know, that's how you lie officially, you know what I mean? Uh, so one thing we have to stay cognizant of is timelines and what people are saying to us and if they're true or not. But he said that there was an interpreter, so that lets you know, you know, that there was some particular reason or point for black Native Americans to learn. And as I just showed you in the other clip, they say that the red Native, red Native Americans actually depended on the black Seminole Native Americans to be the interpreters and the warriors. So who was the interpreter that they saw that came up to them that this guy said? It was the interpreter that was black. It was a black Native American who came up to them and decided to start going back and forth. We have proof here within the information. We have proof here within the videos. You just have to put the dots together based upon multiple different sources. But the information is there. Um, the, the history, the history that has been erased in our nation, and in particular with the Native Americans, happened because it didn't fit the story they created, Manifest Destiny. It only works when Indians were savages, and they had to have savages for commerce and government to expand. The ancient artifacts prove otherwise. Why aren't we looking into those? Peter Lilback is the president of uh, Providence Forum and the author of George Washington's Sacred Fire. Okay, Peter. Um, I think a great place for, for Americans to understand the truth about Americans and Native Americans and African Americans, all of it, it comes from William Penn. Tell the story. Great story. Philadelphia, the great founding city of the United States, that's where government began, it was founded by William Penn. He wanted a city without walls. And he determined that he would do it by making a constant commitment to justice and ethics with the Native Americans. There never was an Indian war with William Penn. Mm. And there's a wonderful treaty that still exists that describes the commitment they made. And it says this, there are good people and bad people among all people. There are good and bad Indians. There are good and bad Christians. That's what he called them in Philadelphia. And he said, we must come together so that we will address these problems that will come with respect and by communication, affirming America. the good. That's where we need to be. Now, there's not just people on the news talking about this. There's people all over the Internet talking about this, whether they be researchers or archaeologists or whoever. So let me give you a little bit more information and show you some more sources of people who are looking at this same topic. In nature, in April 2017, the Ceruti Mastodon site, uh, excavated by the chief paleontologist at the San Diego Natural History Museum, uh, Tom Demeray, a site that shows evidence of human presence 130,000 years ago. That's more than 115,000 years earlier than Clovis. Uh, and I went and met Tom Demeray at the San Diego Natural History Museum. And like anybody else who's suggested an earlier date for the peopling of the Americas, uh, he has suffered the most unpleasant and vicious attacks, mainly from archaeologists. Because he's threatening them, they have somehow missed this that human beings were in the Americas for more than 100,000 years before they said. And Tom Demeray's evidence is compelling. The attacks on him will continue, but he spent a day with me. He showed me that evidence in great detail. Again, I set it out at length uh, in the book, and I'm convinced he's absolutely right. When confronted with the question of who built these earthen structures, 
Later inhabitants of North America didn't accept that these finds were the work of ancestral Indians. The finds indicated a more sophisticated culture had once thrived there. Not only did the current lifestyle of the Indians seem unrelated, but the Indians themselves, when asked who was responsible for the mounds, didn't have an answer. Anxious for a solution, Americans at the time came up with other explanations. The earliest interpretations of the people who built the mounds was that they couldn't have been Native Americans. They had to have been uh, constructed by someone coming in from somewhere else, whether they were lost Welch tribes or lost children of Israel or Maya from South America or something like that. But in fact, they do appear to be, and there's no evidence to suggest that they're not, purely indigenous. The people who were living here at the time constructed them. Even the lost continent of Atlantis was included in these lost race theories. The ideas presented not only seemed exciting and magical, but were probably promoted to increase the value of the artifacts being sold as curios by those plundering the mounds for profit. These theories also supported the then racist notion that Indians were not sufficiently civilized or ambitious enough. The mounds, the mounds, they keep talking about who built the mounds, you know what I mean? They've already said who built the mounds. We showed you earlier in the DeSoto expedition, during the DeSoto expedition, in his book, he said that the people that he encountered built mounds, had temples, all of this stuff. There's multiple things that you hear about the people when they showed up, who they saw was building the mounds. Now they say Native Americans, they describe them as being black, they describe them as being dark copper colored, right? You can still try to think that they're the Asian, Mongolian, Native Americans, but we don't show any proof of what those people looked like, like prior to 1800s. Maybe late 1700s, I haven't even found anything there. But we have guaranteed proof of black people in Indian garb that is definitely from the 1600s, 1700s. In the 1500s, it actually has books describing the people as we have depicted them. Davis sold his collection of artifacts for $10,000. With no reliable federal or state legislation existing to protect these sites, the destruction and looting of the mounds and their buried treasures became a critical problem. They were very obvious. People excavated them purely out of curiosity. Uh, with no record keeping whatsoever. One instance that I know of, a farmer was removing a burial mound, found a copper artifact and used it to repair his shovel. Migration mystery, who were the first Americans? I'll just read a little bit of it. Not so long ago, there was a simple and seemingly controvertible answer to the question of how and when the first settlers made it to the Americas. Some 13,000 years ago, a group of people from Asia walked across a land bridge that connected Siberia to Alaska and headed south. And those people have been named by archaeologists the Clovis culture. We do not know what they called themselves, but this is the name that archaeology has given to these people. And they made these very distinctive Clovis points with, with fluting in them, uh, both arrowheads and uh, spearheads. Um, the Clovis first paradigm that humans had first entered the Americas around 13,400 years ago, that the Clovis culture was the first Native American culture, became a kind of dogma in archaeology. And that's one of the reasons why uh, I disregard archaeology as a science, uh, because there's no room for dogma uh, in science. And this is why the colonies came, to stabilize the land because the dark continent had copper and gold and the discoverers had themselves a plan. They would discover all the places with promise. You didn't need no titles and deeds. Then they would appoint people to make everything legal to sanction the trickery and greed. There's more and more and more information about there being ancient civilizations in the Americas prior, even well past the ancient civilizations of Africa, even well past the ancient uh, Egyptian uh, time. So you got to think about that. If the, and, and I showed you earlier some of the earliest human remains and hu proof of human life, I should say, I don't know about human re remains, but the proof of human life has now been found in the Americas. So this whole notion that black people in America had to come from Africa, it makes no sense. Both continents are 
near the equator. There's areas that are near the equator where life can flourish. And it actually makes more sense that America, being the breadbasket of the world, uh, such a fertile land, one of the most fertile lands on this earth, if not the most fertile, uh, would be the birthplace of civilization. That would make so much more sense, and then we start spreading out from here. But they want you to believe the Africa story. Now, the people that came up with that would have been the Europeans, the ones who lied and concocted this whole story about most of what the map looks like and most of how the world was conquered in the first place. So to take their explanation on what happened at face value is to not be logical about what really they have done in history. There were Mississippian mounds that were dynamited and artifacts hauled out in wheelbarrow loads and sold to people right on the spot and the collection dispersed all over the country. The Spiro Mound site in Oklahoma became known for being a veritable treasure trove of artifacts. In the early 1930s, it was declared the King Tut's tomb of Arkansas Valley as it was being ransacked by a mining company that had control of the land. The local citizens were outraged and became instrumental in Oklahoma passing an antiquities law in 1935. Mount State Park in and of itself is a place that has been utilized, if you subscribe to these numbers, for over 8,000 years. 8,000. And people have been here, they have been utilizing the place right along the White River, right here in Madison County. And later in time, we start seeing them use this, the site not only just for what I would call workshops. You stop, you do something, you leave. Uh, basically, they were stopping making stone tools, and we found several locations along the White River where that's, that's happened. The Egyptian pyramids near Cairo were built as tombs for kings and nobility between 2700 and 1000 BC. It was 500 years later that the first mound building culture emerging in North America began to develop similar burial practices. It was generally accepted that in the 5th century AD, the great archaic cultures came to an end and Europe slipped into the Dark Ages. At the same time, across the Atlantic, the Adena Hopewell era of mound building came to an end. Between 800 and 900 AD, the mighty Mayan Empire of Mexico and Central America began to decline. Similar structures made of earth were being erected by the new Mississippian culture to the north. In 1492, Columbus sailed toward the New World, but he never learned that America was home to this great Mississippian civilization. By the time other Europeans began to explore the continent, the mound builders were destined to disappear. Indeed, Indians had been in Louisiana a long time. Along Bayou Macon near Monroe, are the vast earthworks called Poverty Point, among the largest in North America. It stands as a mysterious testimony to the great Indian civilization that once flourished here, 18 centuries before the birth of Christ. To make matters worse, Louisiana was surrounded by old enemies. There was rivalry over control of Louisiana. Britain claimed it, Spain claimed it. The Indians were really quite powerful and they had many good warriors. The piece of information they had, or at least this is what we were taught, is that unlike the civilized people of Europe, these tribal units actually fought. Our ancestors were some of the most fiercest fighters during the war. During the Indian Wars? Yes. And the Indians depended on them as warriors and interpreters. They keep talking about Native Americans and the black Native Americans being fierce fighters, warriors. I mean, we know that as of today. If you look at most of the black Americans today, especially in... Um, sports that require a lot of strength and endurance, you're looking at black American males to be at the top of the upper echelon of all of those sports, thousand guys. So 
what I'm trying to say is we are not stupid. We know who the real Native Americans were. We know who the real protectors were. We know who the translators were. We know who the mound builders were. We know who the uh, tobacco farmers were, the smokers, tobacco smokers are. We know who the uh, cotton growers and pickers were. We know all of these things. We know who the agriculture agriculture specialists were. We know who these people are because us today as people, we embody these things innately. We get them from our ancestors. The British used their Indian allies against the French and the French used their Indian allies against the British. It was not at all a secure place. Well, the fact is Louisiana was in its first two decades a strategic colony more than anything else for the French. Getting access to the Mississippi River, controlling it, preventing the English from occupying it, establishing a base on the Gulf Coast. All of those objectives were what we might call strategic. The Egyptians were here in Arizona a long time ago. There's no doubt about that if you've done research on it. In 1905 they, they found a cave that went 1,400 feet off the Colorado River and there they went down into it and there was all these mummies, Egyptian artifacts, Egyptian writing, everything else. And, uh, and then in 1925 they found another whole mountain which was called Isis Mountain, unfortunately. <laughs> to give them away. And uh, they went uh, in there and again they pulled out uh, all kinds of Egyptian stuff. It was, uh, both of those events were written in the Arizona Gazette. One of them was six pages long with all the photographs and everything, and the other one was earlier, but it was all, again, explained everything. And then a man of, of the government, this one particular person, didn't like the idea that the Egyptians were here before Christopher Columbus, and took all of these artifacts and put them on a barge out in the land. Is that it raises a big question mark over our entire notion of the prehistory of the world. Because if the Americas have been inhabited by humans for 130,000 years, more than twice as long as Europe and 10 times as long as previously supposed, then everything changes. Suddenly we have a vast, resource-rich landmass. With 130,000 years of human prehistory, of which only the last 13,000 years have been documented because of the archaeological dogma that there was no point in looking deeper. Um, and and uh, goodness knows what was happening here in that time that, that so far just nobody has cared to look for. It could have been the location of hitherto unrecognized advances and developments in the story of civilization. In America, we have, yeah. um, we have 100,000 mounds, one of which is almost as big as the, its, its base is an acre bigger than the Great Pyramid. There's 120 mounds at Cahokia, and all of, all of Egypt has like 106 or 108 pyramids. And it's not as old as the civilizations here. South America has mounds dating to 8400 BC. And South America has more stone structures. I mean, all the stone structures in Egypt would probably fit in one city in South America, one of the, one of the ancient cities there. Well, there's 100,000 mounds in North America. And... The oldest mound in North America now dates to 9,000 BC, 11,000 years old. Nothing in Egypt dates to that. Now, I suspect there were people there in Egypt, but there's no remnants of them from them. So things here, America and South America and Central America, my God, man, the mounds are incredible. The museums that show the things from the mounds uh, are incredible. It's just unreal. And people don't realize what it's like. For more than 50 years, that there was no point in any archaeologist digging below the Clovis level because archaeology had established that there were no human beings in the Americas before Clovis. And in fact, archaeologists who challenged that doctrine, like Jacques Sank Mars, who exca excavated bluefish caves in the Yukon, uh, and found evidence of humans there 24,000 years ago, those archaeologists had their careers ruined. I'm not speaking figuratively, they were literally ruined. Their research funding was withdrawn, they were mocked and humiliated at conferences, They're, they were just shut up by the archaeological 
uh, community. Uh, and as the Smithsonian has recently admitted, rather than launching a major new search for more early evidence, the finds steered fierce, op fierce opposition and a bitter debate, quote, one of the most acrimonious and unfruitful in all science. The LIDAR imagery reveals hundreds of well-defined circular mounds. Note the various sizes of the mounds, including the cluster of smaller mounds in the southeastern part of this image. Let's now move to typology number two, patterned clusters located on lower river terraces. This is Humphrey Slough on the east side of the Washita River in southern Arkansas. The area is heavily forested. The satellite imagery doesn't reveal much. If you strip away the forest, however, you get this interesting image of a number of circular mounds. These mounds lie on four distinct landforms. From left to right, the first, second, and third terraces of the river. On the far right, we move into what I refer to as the uplands, still Pleistocene, but not quite as level. As you can see on the first and second terraces, the mounds line up in curved patterns. These correspond to old point bars that were deposited on these terraces tens or hundreds of thousands of years ago. On the third terrace in the uplands, however, the mounds appear in random patterns. Here's another example of type two clusters in Bowie County, Texas. There's not a lot to be seen from satellite imagery, but you can see the Red River on the upper right-hand side of the image. When you look at the stretched hillshade image, however, a number of mounds pop into view. The mounds on the first terrace of the river line up along point bars, oriented in two separate directions that apparently represent two different meanders in the river in a Pleistocene period. But as you can see, the roots of the people and the cultures and the ancient history of the Americas runs really deep and they are purposely, half purposely, been keeping it this a secret. As I showed you earlier, there was one archaeologist who had his uh, career ruined because of them finding out about uh, or them trying to speak towards what they found in the Americas and trying to tell the truth and digging below the Clovis level or whatever they said. So it's one of those things where if if they're not going to even and, and I showed you on the Fox um, clip, I showed you on the Fox clip as well when they actually said only the savage Indian will be recognized. Who is the savage Indian? That is the Red Mongolian Native Plains Kiowa Indians. Those people who lived in teepees and moved in a primitive, savage-like manner. The civilized people who the guy from the DeSoto expedition said these people were well organized. They had government. They had all these other things that they had. These people live civilly, okay? They weren't primitive or whatever the case they tried to make it seem like they were, these people lived civilly. Okay, so now you might say, hey, Chef Bay, that's a lot of information. I don't think that there's anything going on in today's time about this. Well, let me show you in Miami. In Miami, they were actually going through to build a new high rise. They demolished an area. I don't know if there was a high rise on it or whatever it was on it, but once they demolished it and they go to start building the base, of the um, of the high rise, and they got to dig pretty deep. They started finding all kind of artifacts, all kind of information and artifacts dated to I want to think they said seven to eight thousand years ago. They're still finding stuff today. Why are they still finding stuff today? That's because, like the guy told you. They told them the archaeologists here don't dig past a certain level, and so nobody ha here has digged past the Clovis level. But at the same time, if you do dig and you find something, you'll be shunned in all archaeologists, whatever they have that goes on. So that doesn't even make sense. If you're trying to be part of the community or just to, for the fact that if you're trying to be an archaeologist and your life livelihood is based upon that. You went to school for it, you've got all these degrees, you've been doing all the studying, you done had multiple different jobs, now you hold a position where you done found some new evidence of something uncanny here in the North Americas, and if you tell anybody, that could be your whole, your, your chest could stop coming in. That could be your whole livelihood just shot to hell. So you gotta just 
watch these people. When the, the developer decided that they wanted to build this multi-use uh, building on the site, right, they first of all had to remove a pre-existing structure. And it was well known in the archaeological community that beneath that building there was likely to be some kind of archaeological material. How much we didn't know until that building was removed. It very quickly became clear that the depth and the, the, the horizontal extent and the significance of the archaeological site there was, was more. To put that in, in context, this site is older than the pyramids in Egypt. The site is older or as old as some of the very first cities ever built in Mesopotamia. And yet, very little is known comparatively about these people who, who built this site, who lived there hundreds and thousands of years ago, precisely because there hasn't been enough systematic scientific archaeological work done at the site. One of the tensions throughout this project has been between the developer who's been constantly pushing right, to begin construction and the archaeologists who have been necessarily moving slowly. And we can have the discussion about whether or not this work should have ever happened. As an archaeologist, I feel like this site should have been preserved. But given that the developer is allowed to do this legally, right? I think it is incumbent upon them, it is their responsibility as, as corporate citizens in Miami to make sure that while they are realizing profit, while they are building this building, they are also preserving as much of this site and as much of this information for the future as possible. People would be like, oh, they're just building the Backrat Hotel. It would be a very small portion of the people in Miami that knew what was going on. The dig site is the remains of the Tequesta capital that was at the mouth of the Miami River. And the Tequesta lived along the mouth of the Miami River where it meets Biscayne Bay for thousands of years, uh, well before they were probably even known as the Tequesta, but we do know that name uh, was used by the people who lived there when the Spanish arrived in the 16th century. There's only a couple of historical mentions of the Tequesta, so from those we know a tiny little bit about the people. So archaeology has filled in all the other gaps. And unfortunately, because Miami has been built up so much and so early in the history of Florida, we don't really have that much evidence of the Tequesta. Today, the excavation that's going on in downtown is of the capital where most Tequesta people lived, where they traded, where they had ritual and ceremony, where they met visitors from other regions. So it's a really our only record of that part of Tequesta life. They don't know what they called those Indians or what those people called themselves at the time. They took the word Tequesta because that's what the Spaniards had referenced to the people in Florida, at least one of the names that they found in the book of De Soto or Verrazano's, the ones that I showed you. That's what they're talking about. They just pulled the name from the book. At least they tried to give some kind of uh, credit to a, a reasoning for it and there's some kind of historical reference but at the same time you're still from whatever you want to do and whatever you want to call it and just putting it there just like the Hopi Indians and the Hopewell Indians they say in there we don't know who built the mounds even though they know we don't know who built the mounds we don't know where they came from so or what the people called themselves, so we're gonna call them Hopi Indians. And the crazy thing is, if you came up with that name and called them Hopi and Hopewell Indians, why is there Hopi and Hopewell Indians today? There's tribes of the Red Asian Mongolian natives that call themselves Hopi and Hopewell. Now, mind you, they made that up. White people literally told you they made that up. But at the same time, there's the tribes. Now, if you were to ask the tribes, they'll probably say, well, they said that they made that up and they said that the people were killed, but we've been here, they just lied and, and you know, wanted to tell you that. Which that could be true at, at the same time, but no, likely it's not because you didn't build the mounds. You're not the mound builders. They didn't look like you. They look like us, they look black, Native American. So no, you didn't build the mounds. No, there is no Hopi or Hopewell Indians. And if you have a name and a tribe called Hopi and Hopewell Indians, I really feel like it's a fictitious tribe. The Indian groups that the Soda Expedition encountered were a well-organized society. They had a ruling class. They built mounds for their leaders. They had an extensive trade network over the entire southeast, probably much over the eastern U.S. They were healthy people. We do know that name uh, was used by the people who lived there when the Spanish arrived in the 16th century. There's only a couple of historical mentions of the Tequestas. And we've also discovered 
that after these Spanish expeditions of the 16th century passed through, the result of that, as far as the Indian populations were concerned, was a, a very dramatic change. We think primarily because of those Spanish expeditions. The changes that occurred involved a breakdown of that ruling class. They stopped building mounds. Their ceremonial centers declined. Their physical health declined. The trade network virtually ceased. Just about every aspect of that culture was affected, even down to a change in burial practices. Serving as the director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History, historian Roger Kennedy was shocked to learn, for the first time, that massive ancient city remains existed in North America. This pattern was that discoveries of antiquities conflicted with the thinking of European immigrants, that Native Americans and their ancient ancestors were mere savages. The doctrine of manifest destiny allowed the United States government to classify the Native Americans as savages by their terminology. And by calling them savages, that would allow them to push them aside and basically claim their lands as America expanded in a westward direction. Many other artifacts would turn up that suggested the presence of Middle Eastern cultures in North America. Protestant priests, Catholic fathers, um, uh, Jewish rabbis uh, were seeing these possible links between the, uh, the Native Americans and ancient Israel. These links included written records that uh, had possible tie-ins to the ancient world. Uh, there were certainly religious beliefs, uh, thinking that the Native Americans may have been descendants of some Hebraic, Jewish, Israelite travelers to, to the Americas at different times. Uh, or of other old world peoples at different times. And there are various things uh, uh, fueling these. There were religious, political, and social agendas. Birch bark scrolls, not like uh, English is written in words, but there are pictographs that have been compared uh, to, for example, Egyptian hieroglyphics. We do know that there are certain people who have, who are charged with being the stewards of those scrolls and taking care of them. So they would have closer access to be able to look at and keep those scrolls. Yet many still believe that Native Americans had no written language. In fact, on the Department of Natural Resources website, you can see that it says, we have no idea who these mysterious people were who were creating these images. And this is why the colonies came, to stabilize the land, because the dark continent had copper and gold, and the discoverers had themselves a plan. They would discover all the places with promise. You didn't need no titles and deeds. Then they would appoint people to make everything legal, to sanction the trickery and greed. American First Nations have never achieved anything worth preserving, has resulted in the wanton destruction of thousands and thousands of earth constructions, mounds, embankments, figures, and settlements. So we have lost incalculable amount of archaeological data because of no appreciation of their value for historical purposes. I think the origins of our pattern of obliteration uh, uh, and ignorance of the past of ancient America lies in two ways. First, we thought as a nation that we were starting something brand new. Our founding documents are full of new start, new page, new everything, new order of the universe, we say in our national sale. Powell had become a national hero for exploring part of this new land, the treacherous Colorado River. But what he is not as well known for was his defining of the origin and evolution of Native Americans. Uh, he was more interested in um, putting to rest what he called a mound builder myth, the idea that these mounds had not been built by the prehistoric ancestors of North American Indians. There were some people who were arguing that the mounds had not been built by any of the existing groups of North American Indians, and they would use the, worse indis uh, use the word race indiscriminately. There were others who did argue that no, these were 
um, non-Indian peoples in a biological sense and that they were built by Europeans. They've plundered the, they've blown up mounds, they've plundered antiquities, they've taken what they could and, and either kept it or, or resold it or appropriated it into their culture later on. They've made museums with it and the things that they could have had that actually depicted the people and what they looked like, they probably destroyed. And that's what we're dealing with. That's the type of people we're dealing with. And when you try to tell us or people try to tell us that black people don't know their history, they're just confused, it is not our fault that we're confused. It is not our fault that we have a problem with this. Everybody knows that they kept us from reading and writing and all this other education and stuff for two, three, four hundred years almost. So for the fact that we are now generations later finding out not only just getting caught up on normal world history, but now we have time to go and look back at ancient world history and, and all this. Now we're starting to piece together these puzzles. Now, luckily with the internet and so many people putting this information out there, we're able to finally come up with some for sure stories about what our history was here in the Americas. Thankfully, some artifacts in ancient cities yet remain, such as these once city walls intentionally preserved as mounds in a golf course in Newark, Ohio. I'm standing here at the parallel walls that connect the gigantic octagon with a large circle. The circle is 1,054 feet in diameter. The octagon encloses 50 acres, which is large enough to encompass four Roman Colosseums. This was built by the ancient Hopewell culture that lived in this region between about 100 BC and AD 400. The level of precision. Uh, it is incredible. The entire Newark Earthworks encompasses four and a half square miles, and it was the largest complex of geometric earthworks ever built in the world. It includes two circles, a gigantic octagon, a square. But actually, what we call the Hopewell culture, uh, things like it at least, and things related to it, uh, covered much of eastern North America in different parts. As far south as Florida, as far east as, uh, as far west as Kansas City, as far east as perhaps New York. They had to be incredibly sophisticated. Um, to be able to build these mounds perfectly, you know, in unison to an octagon shape and a circular shape. It's clear that they rival by any scale uh, any other cultural achievement in the world. The Great Pyramids, the Great Wall of China, um, the Roman Colosseum. It also shows that not just high math, but uh, these sites are lined up primarily with uh, the, lunar, uh, the lunar calendar. They had high math, they understood geometry, and because of the lunar calendar, they also understood the heavens, astronomy. What I've learned now is just how amazing uh, they were in terms of their knowledge. To the octagon circle combination at Newark. And to do that across 60 miles, is really a remarkable feat of surveying and setting out and geometry. And we can't deny it, it's a fact, it's there, this 90 degree alignment. This is what you see, this is a 1934 aerial photograph of the circle octagon combination at uh, Newark. Um, and those parts that still survive are, are now largely contained within a private uh, country club, um, including an 18 hole golf course which promotes itself as, quote, unlike any other in the world. It is designed around famous prehistoric Native American earthworks that come into play on 11 of the holes. <laughs> well, I have to say at one level, I find it very disturbing that this ancient sacred site is now a golf course. But at another level, I welcome it because it's preserved that site. If that site hadn't been taken over by a private country club, you can be absolutely sure it would have been plowed under and turned into agricultural land. And then they had a unit of, of measurement was 606, which they call the stade. One side of the Great Pyramid from the base to the tip of the apex is 606 feet. If you square inside the octagon, which the uh, uh, surveyors like to call, it's a term they use, squaring, squaring the circle, and you divide that up into four equal parts inside of cubes, you'll find those cubes are all made of 606 foot lines per cube side. 
The angle of the Great Pyramid of Egypt runs 51.8 degrees uh, up the slope from the base to the, to the angle. That, that measurement is there. And when you come off of the, uh, the baseline at uh, Newark and you run true north and then measure that angle back to the baseline, what do we find? 51.8 degrees. So did they have the same math as the ancient Egyptians? Uh, well, I gotta say, yeah, it sure looks like it. It's as inspiring, I think, in its way as the, the NASA program to send a man to the moon. With nine other gentlemen, and they began to dig that mound down. And they uncovered it. When they did, they found a wooden coffin made out of oak. And opening up that coffin in there was a large skeleton of a man. But also in this coffin was a little box, uh, no more than maybe about eight or ten inches in size. And it was cemented shut. Wyrick and the men, while they're all there together, they pried this box apart, and in it was a black stone. They, they opened this box, and here was this unusual artifact. We own the Newark Holy Stones, and these stones were found in a Hopewell mound in the 1860s, and uh, the presumption from finding them was that perhaps the American Indians were, had some kind of contact with, uh, the, with the, the Hebrews, or possibly they were the Hebrews, that's another idea. So, so we have, our, the museum has been interested in origins. They took it to uh, some scholars, identified that it was probably some type of Hebrew. They took it to some uh, rabbis living in the area. And upon looking at it, they said yes, they could read it. And it was a complete rendition of the Ten Commandments. They called it Block Hebrew because they had never seen anything written like this but they called it Black Hebrew. And so then, naysayers started picking on Weirich. He was accused of sticking this stone in front of these nine men somehow and being able to hide it and conceal it. Upon examination, mainstream archeologists proclaimed the stones a hoax, while many diffusionists continue to believe in their authenticity. There has been good points on um, either side for whether they are a first, uh, a first millennium piece of, of artifact or something that was devised in the 19th century. So for those people that talk about how we have this identity crisis and they try to reference Kanye, talk about being Native American and we talk about being black. And we, but technically, it's a possibility that all of those could be true. So we could have been Hebrew Israelites. We could have been black Native Americans, which we were. We could have been Egyptians, possibly. We could have been Baptists, we could have been Christians, we could have been Muslims, we could have been Moors, we could have been anything. Because there's a lot of time that has passed and you have a whole continent of possible black Native Americans who can be anything. So it's not an identity crisis, trying to piece together the puzzle of what our history is because people are purposely lying and keeping the information from us. We have Meltwater Pulse 1B at the end of the Younger Dryas and this is the point where I need to ask, was Turtle Island, and that's the name that Native Americans give to North America, could Turtle Island have been the fabled and mu much scoffed at lost continent, lost civilization of Atlantis? Because that date, 11,600 years ago, 9,600 BC, is precisely the date that Plato gives us for the destruction and flooding of Atlantis. And I can show you how he gives it to us. Uh, Plato uh, appears to have got the story through his ancestral line, through the Greek lawmaker Solon, who visited Egypt in 600 BC, uh, and was there told by the priests the story of Atlantis and how it had been destroyed by flooding. Uh, and when Solon asked the priests, Solon asked the priests, when, when did this happen? When was Atlantis uh, swallowed up by the sea? When, when did it vanish? And they answered rather matter-of-factly, 9,000 years ago. That was in 600 BC. That's 9,600 BC. That's 11,600 years ago. That is Meltwater Pulse 1B. If Plato made the whole story up, as archaeologists claim, he was astonishingly on the money with the latest scientific evidence about the end of the last ice age. In the scattering of Israel, are there other linguistic evidences that may lend support to diffusionist ideas? As a scholar of ancient languages, uh, I have discovered that there are many symbols in the Mi'kmaq 
that are, the, are very close and similar to those of ancient Egyptian. About 700 BC in Egypt, um, there was a language that was developed or came in that was called Marotic from the kingdom of Moro, which many Egyptian scholars have even called Reformed Egyptian because it's so different than what uh, the standard Egyptian that we know. And these, this Marotic is very close to some of those, the signs uh, of, of the Mi'kmaq. Anthropologists dismiss a lot of the stone evidence and inscri inscription uh, inscriptions in these ancient languages like Egyptian and Greek and Hebrew by saying well they were not found in the course of an official excavation. Are these diffusionist ideas simply a continuation of the controversies that existed in John Wesley Powell's day? There were some people who were arguing that the mounds had not been built by any of the existing groups of North American Indians and they would use the, worst, uh, use the word race indiscriminately there were others who did argue that no, these were um, non-Indian peoples in a biological sense and that they were built by Europeans. When confronted with the question of who built these earthen structures, later inhabitants of North America didn't accept that these finds were the work of ancestral Indians. The finds indicated a more sophisticated culture had once thrived there. Not only did the current lifestyle of the Indians seem unrelated, but the Indians themselves, when asked who was responsible for the mounds, didn't have an answer. Anxious for a solution, Americans at the time came up with other explanations. Another thing about the mound builders is in a clip right here, I show you where they said when they asked the Red Mongolian Native American Indians who built these, they said they had no clue. Those Native Americans said they had no clue who built them. So at that particular point, they're saying it's not them and it wasn't the Europeans. So who else could it have been? They're leaving purposely. They're leaving us out of the history. It would have been the other group of people that was here, which were the black Native Americans that you ran into when you first got here. That's who it was. But they don't want to throw that out there because that's going to shake up history, right? So as I showed you, we are the Native Americans. Now I'm not trying to, again, exclude the red Asian Mongolian Native Americans. You came here at some point, I would love to see more proof if anyone, any one of you can comment or show links or information or photos of proof of who you all were where you all were, what years, and how you looked, and how you were depicted from the 1700s, 1600s, 1500s, 1400s, the sooner or the later, the better. What does this mean for those people who are possibly Native American, but they don't know? Their family has been talking about it. You haven't tried to even look anything up. You haven't registered or anything. Where do we go from here? Well, I plan on doing many other series and, and, and videos to try to prove more information about where we were, who we were, and this Native American story, and try to fill in as many gaps as I can uh, while staying current on what's going on in the latest breakthroughs. So I, what, what we need to do from here is talk to your family. Talk to the oldest people in your family and ask them, are we Native Americans? Have you heard anything about us being Native Americans? And even if they say no, what you have to do is take your names, take their names, the oldest people you can find, and look in as many records as possible. The Dawes Rolls work, D-A-W-E-S, the Dawes Rolls, R-O-L-L-S, the Dawes Rolls. That's only for the Cherokee, Choctaw Creek, Chickasaw and Seminole nations, but there were still Blackfoot nations, Shinnecock, um, many other nations. And then those nations included many different tribes. So there were different tribes within those nations. So 
It's not confusing, but what you're gonna have to do is just get as much information as you can and start doing some research to see if you can find any records of your family members being Native American. And if you can find any information of them being Native American, then go ahead, start doing the steps to register with the tribal council wherever that's at for your for your tribe. So in Oklahoma, we have many different tribes and reservations and stuff, and there's different, I think there's some kind of organization in each one that you can contact. That's what you're gonna wanna do. We wanna make ourselves known, first of all, officially, uh, that we are here, we remember, and we're not going anywhere, and, and we want our, 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 our time back, we want our, our tribal time back, we want our, and we want our tribal membership back, and we want to be recognized as who we are, as the true black Native Americans. Citizens, the citizenship may be granted, but they may be treated as second class citizens in the Creek Nation, and that's not acceptable. We're seeking specifically to make sure that they're granted full citizenship, the right to vote, the right to hold office, the right to run for office, the right for all benefits that are granted to all equally situated Creek citizens. We can't accept anything less. That's what we're asking them for. We also have federal defendants in this case. The reason we have federal defendants is because we have to make sure that on both sides of the aisle here, both at the tribal level and at the federal government level, that rights are protected. And we're asking that the federal defendants be enjoined be restricted from taking any action or providing any benefits to the tribe until this citizenship is granted in full to our clients. In addition, we're asking that the court appoint through the BIA a trustee to make sure that these rights are protected. The black people, they are the original owners of America. Wow. Black people, Af wow. African Americans, they were already here and they plagued them out. And they stole the, Smiths, the Smithsonian Institute, which is Jesuit controlled, stole their knowledge, stole their history, and now we're just left wondering who we are, where we are, where we come from, where we're going, we don't know anything. Just go into a country, plague the whole place mm -hmm. out, and then take over their buildings. New York was already there for thousands of years. San Francisco was there for thousands of years. Los Angeles was there for thousands of years. They were built by the indigenous people who were black and, Indi and, and Indians as well. Whoa. The black people, they are the original owners of America. We have been the at the forefront of running this stuff. That's just history. Because there's something in us in a transformation that we have gone through. No matter how damn degenerated we might look today walking around the ghettos or whatever. There's something in us that's unique. That puts us closer to the ancient Egyptians than the damn Africans. That's why we connected back with it. And this was prophesied. This is once referred to as underdeveloped and now called mineral rich. And the game goes on eternally. Unity kept just beyond reach. Egypt and Libya used to be in Africa. They've now been moved to the Middle East. There are examples galore, I assure you. But if interpreting were left up to me, I'd be sure every time folks knew this version wasn't mine, which is why it is called his story. <laughs>